Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Muki Mohammed, and I'm honored to have a conversation with two amazing women about the historic year of 2020, a year all of us will remember for more years to come. In today's edition, we'll focus on kids, schools, and managing family routines. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Fadima Balale. Um, I live in this in Renton, Washington. I have three children. Um, I'm an educa special education advocate. Uh, my role in the community is I speak about the injustices our children face in the school districts and in education and specifically about special education. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk more about COVID-19 and 2020, uh, the incredible year that we've had. My name is Shukri Olo and I am a parent as well of two young kiddos who sort of refuse to stop aging. Uh, an 11 year old come this Wednesday, inshallah, and an eight year old boy. I'm also a doctoral candidate, finishing my doctorate in education leadership at Seattle U uh, 2021 in May, and a candidate for office for King County Council District 5, which covers seven cities in South King County. Well, like I mentioned before, I have three children, three young children. Um, I have an 11-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 2-year-old. Well, she just turned three. And um, my middle child is autistic, and he has an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan. Um, my 11-year-old just went to middle school, and um, she's on another path. She is on a highly capable honors program. So in both senses, there are very rigorous um, routes for children in the sco school district. So when we heard about the COVID, we were, of course, concerned and apprehensive and um, worried about our children's safety. So when schools were closed, I was one of those parents who was glad because I consider my children's safety first, especially when it comes to an unknown pandemic at the time. Um, while that was happening we were not pleased with how the schools handled it um, but we can understand that it was a surprise but in fact after school started in September the same issues we were still facing um, you know the lack of communication the lack of parental involvement in the decision making tables we were also dealing with all the unknown and most things were being done last minute so that was the struggle um, as well as trying to maintain our children's social emotional well-being how do we take care of our children during an unprecedented pandemic where they're quarantined at home? So in that way, it was quite difficult and stressful, and we've had to rise up to the occasion. I work professionally at King County, and so we found out, I think, towards the end of February or early March that there was a global pandemic just sort of starting, uh, and many of us were sent home to work remotely. Uh, for an unknown period of time and what that meant was trying to figure out like while I'm still in school still working full-time um, and with two children who also have to do remote learning um, and in the beginning it was incredibly I think difficult right because our kiddos are not really tech savvy we don't like we didn't have a laptop we we're more of a, sort of an outdoorsy family like we hike we um, ski and all the, all the stuff that you know people do outside um, and and so they didn't have access to a computer um, they had an iPad but that was not sort of the same um, and then we had to figure out you know we have to get an, a computer for them they have to start using it um, or learn how to use it um, and I remember getting so much communication from the school as well and thinking like how do you ex expect us to sort of be able to manage this endless and constant communication when we're just getting connected to the internet uh, for the first time. Um, and it wasn't just myself who was sort of challenged by that as well. I think there were a number of parents who were um, in my kiddos' classrooms who were saying like, how do I get logged in? And um, I remember you know, helping them get logged in and saying, you know, what can I do? Because um, many of us have um, that language accessibility, right? Um, and so I, I think it was incredibly difficult that I um, at first was, you know, they had like two months of schooling left. And so I said, we're going to prioritize their mental health. Like none of us know what's happening. 
Um, and then in the summer months when they were on break, we spent a lot of time trying to catch up and um, trying to make sure that they're ready for the school year. And this year has definitely been a better transition. Um, and our school district has also been able to prioritize our families in a way that I feel like um, was handled differently than the, the beginning of the pandemic. So I would say overall sort of pros and cons um, to, to this, uh, you know, the opportunity to spend more time with my children, um, with our children and learn more about, you know, their likes and dislikes and um, be able to teach them our, uh, our language and, um, you know, get to know them as human beings has been a wonderful experience so far. Um, but on the tech side and trying to manage, you know, a third graders canvas schedule and th their assignments and are they keeping on track and, you know, why are they on a break? Didn't they just have a break? Like what's happening um, has been quite, quite a challenge for sure. If we're thinking about this special education, I found that some of the old, some of the prior problems we've had with schools have just become more compacted. They're just more visible. We see more of the same issues. And I do realize that, you know, um, some the schools are doing their best, but their best isn't enough. It has never been enough. It wasn't good enough before, and it isn't now. So my question is, and I'm holding the schools accountable for the lack of preparation. A lot of families are struggling struggling with the computers and um, you know they're struggling with the internet and they're struggling with accessibility some families have very um, some parents are working full-time outside of the home and have very small children some of them with special needs and how do you teach a child who doesn't even want to sit down and a child with ADHD who's constantly in motion there are people who've taken years of education to teach a special education and all of a sudden parents who have work who have other children who have other duties um, are also now having to teach their children. So for those families who can, it has been amazing. And you can see the disparities. People with more resources have created pods. They have tutors. Some people can't even sign their children on because they're at work and they're essential workers and the schools aren't providing the daycare and the, you know, the essential needs of the students. We're talking about homeless and houseless children who are not getting access to safe spaces and the food they need. Um, so. There is a lot of saying the schools are supporting us, but they're not as they should be. Um, you know, we as parents have had to step up, have had to support each other. Um, uh, my child is in the sense struggling because he just is not compatible with online schooling. He is more of a hands-on learner. He needs his peers, he needs his school, he needs his tools. Um, and my middle schooler needs her friends. She needs the social peer interactions and the one-on-one -on -one learning. She, like I said, is on a rigorous uh, learning schedule and uh, is in love with science and is missing all those. So I am sad for our children and we should expect more from the schools. I think that was great. Um, and just to add, I think my general orientation is both grace and accountability. Um, and I know that um, our school districts are trying their best, right? Like this is uh, an unprecedented year that we've had and there are lots of challenges. And I, I'm sure uh, there are areas where they could be held accountable for those challenges. But I also know that um, we are figuring things out as we go and the situation continues to evolve. and. Uh, many of us are doing the best that, that we can, uh, including our families and uh, school districts, our teachers. Um, I hope that we take this time as an opportunity to invest in mental health um, because I know that it's not just our children who are missing out um, on that social emotional component, but also our teachers who are trying to hold 20 students in a classroom while they are you know, trying to figure out how to get basic needs to this family or, you know, counseling services to this other family or, um, you know, housing resources for another family, right? Um, and so our educators are also overburdened by uh, the, you know, sort of struggles that we've had this year. And so I'm hoping that, you know, many of us could take lessons from this and figure out come 2021 if there's an opportunity to invest in mental health. In many ways, a lot of families are going through it. You know, we have all had family who um, have had, they have gotten the COVID. That has been extremely difficult, isolating families in their own home. And if anyone is a mother or a father, they know how difficult that can be in your own home, isolating from your children. So just the dangers of the families working. And, you know, for me, 
um, this year has taught me, has opened my eyes even more, and has shown um, the disparities in all the things and how black and brown children and children with language accessibility, is, families with second language learners, families who have special needs, families on the low income are getting the brunt of the burden. Um, I am not at the moment having any grace for anybody, I'm mostly holding people accountable. I want us to not go back to a system that did not support us before. I am now looking at it and seeing all the glaring problems we've had, the issues that were swept under the rug. If and when we do go back to normal, I would like to see more accountability. I would like to see people like Shukri who are running for office holding schools more accountable, um, holding more leaders accountable, having more representation in teachers and um, in school boards and um, in all the places where we need parents of color, black parents, parents from immigrant families being represented. So that other people don't speak for our children because I know for a fact they don't know the needs of our families, they don't know the needs of our children. If we don't have those types of representation, if we're not at the tables where decisions are being made for our children, we have seen, for example, most of the schools in the urban areas that are closed are the schools that serve black and brown children and people on the economic ladder. More, um, the New York Times just published an article, I think it's in the school district with more white students, 36% of them were closed, whereas for black and brown children it's 56 or 60 something percent of schools where mostly black and brown children were closed with extreme lack of resources, um, extreme lack of technology, extreme lack of support, extreme lack of education for the parents to teach their own children. So we're seeing this pandemic and how it has affected us more. Not only are we talking about mental health, we're talking about health and how black, black and brown children and black and brown parents and Somali parents are dying more from the COVID because of the health uh, disparities. So disparities are everywhere. And this year, 2020 has taught me, I am tired of turning the other cheek. I am only ready to face it forward, deal with the problems. We are tired of being in the shadows. We are here and we're gonna change for our children because I think the time for quietness has, is past. Yeah, like my sister Fatima said beautifully, I think we cannot afford to go back to normal, right? Like this has been a year where many of us had an opportunity to sit and reflect on uh, the kind of country that we hope to be. Um, and because of the racial reckoning that we've seen happen in 2020 um, and sort of all of these issues compounded and um, highlighted the deep disparities within our systems and not just in the field of education, uh, but also in housing, um, in uh, access to health care and economic justice and um, in transportation access, right? Like all of these issues disproportionately impact communities of color and black and brown communities in particular. Um, and so many of us have seen the data and finally are beginning to wake up. And I hope that come 2021 and beyond that we um, don't just sit with the data, that we actually move on it in a way that impacts uh, all of our communities um, positively. I think there is uh, sort of a deep mistrust of government, right, um, and community. And I think a lot of that distrust is valid. Um, when we think about the historical um, you know, lens and sort of how vaccines came about and um, who it was experimented on and the impacts of those experimentations. I think there are a lot of communities who uh, are afraid um, and rightly so. Um, and I also know that um, there's an opportunity to educate uh, a lot of community members on the impacts of vaccines and what it can do if it's ethically um, you know, supplied to communities, um, especially communities of color who are impacted disproportionately by COVID. Um, and so I actually am planning on doing a town hall on COVID with uh, black doctors and um, talking about this exact topic. And we've seen, you know, a couple of videos on vaccines um, within the Somali community where mothers were being asked, like, what do you think about the vaccine? And lots of conspiracies out there, you know, and I am not sure who's sort of putting that out, but I think there's an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, WhatsApp, it's a, yeah, the, the WhatsApp with the Somali moms. Um, I had to leave that group actually, it was pretty toxic, but um, there is an opportunity to educate and so that's where I think we could play a role as uh, members of this community. Um, what I feel about the virus vaccines is, I would think is uh, learn as much as you can, 
consult of a physician. Um, I personally don't have any feelings about it because I'm not a health professional. Um, but I hope that everybody who um, is thinking about it, please educate yourself and you know learn as much as you can. What is the best thing for this situation? I think is being learning as much as you can. Learn about the disease that we're, you know, the virus that is impacting us, and what have we found? Social distancing works. It has worked for us. Alhamdulillah, we have been safe because we are practicing extreme social distancing. Regardless of interviewing today, we have been making sure that we are not impacting or getting it from anybody. So in that way, social distancing, wear your masks, wash your hands properly, utilize cleaning agents very well I mean only go to essential appointments um, make sure you're not visiting your family unnecessarily to harm them and harm yourself so you're not um, spreading anything more than anything I'm just wishing people to be safe and to take care of themselves and be healthy I think this has been a really hard year for us as Somalis in particular because we are a communal society right and constantly going in and out of our aunt's houses or our uncle's houses and seeing each other and having gatherings and going to weddings um, and a lot of that has been disrupted and so um, almost a year of it actually and so I can acknowledge uh, the, the sort of real challenges that people have had in um, adhering to some of the standards around um, COVID uh, precautions um, but I also know that uh, one of my favorite hadiths is uh, by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. Um, and I feel often that we do the trusting in God, right? We, you know, if we're going to get sick, then it's up to God, or if that was going to happen, it was meant to be. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala also said, tie your camel, meaning do your work, um, put in the effort, wear the mask, get treatment. And so I'm hoping that we remember the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and stay safe, mask up for all of us. The message that I would like to send elected officials or uh, local government or county government um, is to listen to community. I, I feel like there have been plenty of opportunities where community members have been talking about sort of the injustices that it, they've been impacted by, whether it's education or healthcare or um, employment or any other system. Um, and finally, government is seeing that the data is there um, and what community has been saying for nearly decades um, has come uh, out and sort of been highlighted because of 2020. And so my advice, uh, first to myself, um, is to always listen to the people that we serve. Um, what I would tell government officials, county officials, city officials are the people that in need, they need support. We need support with employment, um, we need employment benefits, we need um, to work on um, supporting the houseless families, we need to support more education resources for families with young children. We want to make sure that when we take our families to the hospitals that we're being treated um, as importantly as everybody else. So we need to make sure that our essential workers are being protected and given the right resources to do their work properly and more than anything um, we need the support of each other you know as a community we need to step up we need to if you have more give more and if you need more please ask I think in that way we especially Somali people are a very community oriented fam um, support groups we are a society which comes through for each other and I hope other communities can take advantage of it and learn from us that you know when one of us is down someone always steps up and I think during 2020 we have seen a lot of that a lot of families supporting each other with food with um, you know medical supplies as it were driving I know I I have dropped a bunch of groceries, I have dropped some cooked food, and I know my friends have done the same as well. So more than anything, support each other. Um, be safe out there, be healthy. Thank you for listening. Please make sure to share, like, subscribe to Runta News Channel at YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter.